What's up, church? We doing good this morning? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I want to share something before we even get into the Word. This is not a part of my notes, but I heard Holy Spirit say this because I love it when we go into worship and you hear, like, kids cry out. You know what I mean? And they could be just doing their own thing, like, ah, you know, the noises that kids make. But there's a scripture, one of my favorite Psalms is Psalms chapter 8. And verse 2 says, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. So I want to speak this, that when your kids are going ah, in the middle of worship, they're actually stopping the enemy from entering this place. Come on. Man, what, a, what an awesome thing that we can get our kids used to the presence of God, even when they're infants. Right? See, come on. Keep singing out. <laughs> Well, that's it for this week. Let's go. No. <laughs> well, if you're visiting, uh, man, we just want to say we're excited that you're here. It's a packed house. I love it. I love that there's a, a bunch of group of people saying, well, we just want to come into the glory of God today. We want to come into his presence. So as Joe Tyndall said last week, you got to, in order to get where we're going, we got to look to where we've been, right? So two weeks ago, Pastor Matt finished this series on James. And James is one of my favorite books because it's the, one of the most practical books. It's considered New Testament wisdom literature. So if you missed any of those, I want to encourage you to go back to those. Because the end goal of, of, of faith is not to memorize the scriptures, but to live them. Does that make sense? The end goal of faith is not to just be able to quote scripture off the top of your mind, but it's to live every scripture that comes across it. Does that make sense? Matt, Pastor Matt said this. He said that the, the generation at hand is not looking for an explanation. The world's heard about God's love for so long, right? They're looking for a demonstration. They're looking for us to live what we believe. That's where the whole faith without works kind of things with James kind of came in. But then last week we kicked off this new series. Pastor Joe Tindall got up here singing and dancing and doing the running man and all kinds of stuff. I'm pretty sure hot chocolate got mentioned in there somehow. So I just, uh, he started this identity crisis series. And I just want to tell you my heart. Um, once you start to embrace what God says about you, it will radically change your life. Yeah. This identity crisis, it can either be a concept or it can be a matter of your heart where you let God come in and mold you into who he's created you to be. So I want to encourage you, you know, last week Joe brought some meat, man. It was meat to eat, not just for that day, but for the rest of your life. But I also want to encourage you that this week, and as Pastor Rick comes up next week, to hold on to what God is, is revealing and speaking in and over you, because ultimately it was meant to flow through you. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's two quotes that Pastor Joe Tyndall said last week that, that shook my world. The first one is, God has not lost the blueprint to your life. God has not lost the blueprint to your life. And oftentimes we catch a glimpse of this, right? We get so excited and then all of a sudden we go off and we do our own thing and we turn to God. We're like, God, where are you? Like, this isn't what it looked like when I sat next to you in, in, uh, in one of our men's groups hey, we, on Friday at 6. If you haven't been there, men, we have a men's group at Friday at it's six. Um, if you haven't been, so at one of our men's groups on Friday at six, we, we shared this story and it was this, this couple, right? When they started dating, they had this single cab truck with the bench seat and, and he would, the, the, the male would always drive and, the, and the, his girl would always sit right next to him. So he would, he would have one wheel on the steering wheel, the other one on his girl and they were super close and they ended up getting married. And after 40 years of marriage, she ended up being on the other side of the truck and she looked at him because he's still driving. And she said, man, I wish things were the way that they used to be. And he said, well, I haven't moved. But sometimes that's how faith is, right? We get excited for God right off the bat. And we're like, man, I just want to rest my head on the chest of Jesus. And 12 years down the road, 30 years down the road, 40 years down the road, we're like, God, where are you? And the truth of the matter is God hasn't moved. He's still there. He has not lost the blueprint to your life. The second thing, and I believe that this could be the phrase to sum up the whole series, is that people may describe you, but only God can define you. That's right. People may describe you, but only God can define you. And what I've come to learn is that a lot of people are living based on descriptions instead of definitions. Does that make sense? So this is where I want, I want to roll from that because there's a purpose to identity. It's not just something that you say over you. It has meaning. It has intentionality. It has purpose. So I want to start with the scripture in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. It says, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. 
You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other greater commandment is greater than these. So essentially, this is what God has taught us. He said, I want you to love God with all of your being, and I want you to love others. Those are the commandments. That's the purpose of the church. That's our purpose, is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then it's to love others. But what you have to see is there's three important relationships just in that greatest commandment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you those and I'm going to give you in the order of their importance. The first one is love God. Nothing should ever supersede God. You should never love anything more than God because then it becomes an idol in your life. Does that make sense? You should love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your being. All, all, it basically comes down to this. Love God with every ounce of who you are. Not just when it's convenient and not just when times are hard. All the time. He doesn't give us a a specific, love God when you're this, love God when you're that. No, love God. Just love him. The second one is love yourself. He said, love your neighbors as yourself. Meaning the third one is love your neighbors. So here's what God has showed me about that whole phrase. The first thing he showed me is you could love, only love others to the capacity that you love you. You can only extend love to the other, to other people around you to the capacity that you love you. The second thing they showed me, is you can only receive love to the capacity that which, of which you love you. Does that make sense? Yes. This is what happens. If you receive love in a greater capacity than you love you, then you automatically tell yourself you're not worthy. That's how it happens. Maybe, some, maybe you're sitting here right now and you've told yourself that before, that you're not worthy. And that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Here's a question. Can I ask you a really hard question to start things off? Yep. You guys ready for this? You better buckle up. <laughs> What if a false perception of who you think you are is keeping you from experiencing all the, the love that God wants to show you? I'm going to say it one more time. What if a false perception, a false reality, a false identity is keeping you from experiencing all the love that God wants you to experience? Because the truth of the matter is God is love. Every ounce of his being is love. He can't not love you with all that he is because that would be against his character. But your perception of you could prevent what he's trying to give you. There's a, a buddy of mine, he was a mentor, his name is Dub, he's got a little girl named Baby, we always called her Baby Cinda, and one night at dinner, you know, they, they kind of had a tradition, Dub would give Cinda four Skittles. So one night at dinner, he's like, Cinda, I'm going to give you nine Skittles, and she said, no dad, I just want four. He said, God revealed to him at that moment, sometimes God's trying to give us nine, when, but we only say yes to what we're familiar with. Sometimes that happens with our faith and and how we receive love from God. God is trying to extend the fullness of his love to us. But sometimes we only say yes to what we're familiar with because we don't know who we are. See, this is the truth of the matter is I believe that we that 98 percent of our struggles come because we operate out of somebody we weren't created to be. Meaning we operate out of a false identity. When you know who you are, when you listen to what God says about you. It allows you to, it gives you permission and the strength and the authority to not pick up things that you're not supposed to pick up. See, some of us are struggling with stuff that we've picked up that have nothing to do with who we are because we're living as somebody that we were never created to be. This is what I mean. I heard a pastor say it this way. He said, most of the time Christians are offended because they're living as someone that uh, they're living outside of their identity. They don't know who they are and they're offended by people who don't know who they are. Because if we knew who we were, we could say, we could compare what people say about us, say to us, and we could say, this is not in alignment with what God says about me. So I'm not going to pick it up. A lot of the fights that we get in, like, let's just be honest. A lot of the fights that we get in, if we would just weigh what God says about us, we wouldn't ever get in these fights. We'd say, nah, that's not, that's not me. It's not what God says about me. Because this is what happens. This is why identity is so important. Because identity teaches you to see you the way God sees you. The reason it's important, though, isn't for you. Because once you learn to love you the way God loves you, it then gives you permission to love and see others the way God sees them. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Do I have any parents in the place? I know there's parents. I just wanted to ask. Uh, I'm just yeah. joking. <laughs> it's like, Matt, there's a room full of <laughs> people everywhere. There's got to be a parent. Uh, one of the most important things that you could do as a parent is speak identity over your children. Amen. That way, when they get into the world, they're not letting other people describe them, but they're speaking from what God has defined them as. Yes. Yeah. See, here's the danger in that, though, is you have to speak what God speaks over them, not what you want to speak over them. Your kid's identity may not be your identity. Your kid's anointing may not be your anointing, 
But God, that doesn't mean that, that they're not as gifted or not as useful in the kingdom. See, one of the things, you see this kind of struggle, like you have a, a dad that's super athletic and he has three kids and two of the kids love to play the sport that the dad loved to play, but then another son loves piano, right? So what happens is if the dad tries to speak, try to speak sports over this kid that loves the piano, it doesn't motivate him to be athletic. It actually discourages him because he doesn't think he's good enough in the father's eyes. Does that make sense? See, this is, I, I love my dad. My dad is, uh, he's here. He's over there. Give him a big old hug. He loves those. Uh, uh, my dad is a master craftsman. Like, I, uh, growing up, my dad's always done stuff with his hands. He's, I've seen him texture. I've seen him lay tile. Like, I've seen him done, do some creative stuff with tile. My dad's a master craftsman. We have a three-car, or they do. I don't live there anymore. Um, they, they have a three-car garage in the back of their house that my dad and my little brother built because I was inside. Okay? See, here's the thing, though. Like, there's a joke at our house. There's a joke, like, my parents will come up to me and they'll be like, did you get your hands dirty today? I'll be like, no, I chose my job wisely. Like, I chose a different <laughs> occupation. Not to say, listen, not to say that I didn't choose, that, that that's an unwise decision, but that was what my dad was created for. My dad's create was created to work with his hands, but my identity lies in something else. See, this is the truth, though, is my dad knows that, and my dad pours into me, and he tells me all the time how proud of me he is right? See, to speak identity over your kids is to speak life into them. It's to open up the door for, for, um, for, for what ultimately what God calls them and created them to do, to start paving its way so that they could be molded by that instead of be molding by, molded by other people. So the purpose of this series is to teach you to listen to what God says about you. Because if you don't, then you'll let other things try to define you. Amen. That's good. It, you'll let other things try to define you. So I want to talk about these two words. I am. I am. How many of you know that what you speak over you is super powerful. I think sometimes we're, we're not very conscious of the words that we say over us. Uh, James chapter 3, going back to the James series, talks about the power of the tongue. And then Proverbs says that the tongue has the power of life and death, and those that like to speak will taste its fruit. I like to talk. I eat a lot of, yeah. of my words. Um, <laughs> ask my wife. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> but... That, 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 that whole thing is relevant to you because a lot of times when we think the power of the tongue, we think about what we say over to other people. No, what you say over you is just as powerful as what you say to other people. Yes. Right? Does that make sense? James chapter 3 talked about the bits changing the direction of a horse and the rudder changing the direction of a ship. But how many of you know that the tongue will direct your life? The things that you say over you will, uh, the, uh, are ultimately the direction that you're going into. This is what I believe. Okay, you ready for this? People come up to you and they ask you, how are you doing? A lot of us want to say I'm busy because we think busyness is a justification. Actually, what you're doing is you're inviting busyness. You're inviting the enemy to come take your time. When you say I'm tired, when you say I'm broke, when you say I'm broke, you're inviting brokenness into your finances. Let me just be real with you guys. What you speak over you is powerful. What you speak over you is powerful. I want to show you, okay, right? Because anytime we speak about us, we have to use those two words, I am, right? I am. So Jesus is in the garden, right? Right. He's about to go to the cross, got a couple of disciples with him, and he's in the garden, and the Roman guard come to arrest him, and Jesus sees him, and he says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazarene. Jesus says, I am he, and immediately everybody falls down. Why? Because Jesus was declaring to the world around him who he was. Who he was. This is what I believe, is I believe that when you declare who you are, and it's in alignment with God, what God says about you, it can knock down the enemy around you. Yeah. Does that make sense? You, what you say about you is super powerful. And if it's in alignment with what God is speaking over you, it'll knock down the enemy around you. I love the story of Moses. You look in Exodus and, and Moses had, is at this burning bush and God is speaking to him through it. And he tells him, God, Moses, I need you to go deliver my people. Go set my people free. Moses has, has wrestled. He's like, God, I'm not a good talker. I stutter a lot. And then Moses, it says that he protested. In Exodus 3 verse 13, it says he was protesting to God. It says, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, uh, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? And what should I tell them? So ultimately, they're going to say, like, who sent you? Like, we know where you came from. Who sent you? If we're to believe you, who sent you? And God replied to Moses. He said, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. I am. Jesus was proclaiming who he was. I am. This is interesting. Okay, this is what I've learned. 
is the reason I think God's name is just I am is because he could be anything that he needs us, to, uh, that we need him to be. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Jesus is I am. As soon as we put a third word attached to it, well, then we start putting limitations on him. Yes. God is unlimited. He's limitless. Let me say it that way because yeah, I just, it just stumbled out the first time. But this is what I love about God. If his name is I am, this is what you have to see is God is a father. In the Old Testament, we, talk, we see God referred to as Yahweh, Jehovah, Lord, uh, Lord God. But when Jesus came on the scene, he shifted the perspective of people. He said, my heavenly father and your father. My heavenly father and your father. Ultimately, because he wanted people to not just see God as a judge, but to see them as a father. How many of you know that how you see God is the lens through which you read the word? Yes. That's right. If you think God is a judge, then you're going to read the Bible and you're going to think it's condemning you. But if you see God as a father, then you know it's him preparing you to walk out as an adult in life. To walk out as a son or walk out as a daughter. So God is a father and God is always, a good father is always speaking out over you. This is what I believe about God though. I think he only speaks about you how he sees you from his kingdom. I talk about Gideon a lot. I like Gideon, I think. Um, <laughs> no, I really do. I really do. Uh, Gideon, if you look at the story in Judges, Gideon comes from the weakest tribe. He's the smallest guy, the weakest tribe, and this angel comes to him, and he's hiding behind a barrel, right? And he, he says, rise up, mighty warrior of God. Rise up, mighty warrior of God. It's interesting to me that it doesn't say, rise up, Gideon, mighty warrior of God. He says, rise up, mighty warrior of God. Why? Because that's how God sees him. God sees him as a mighty warrior of God. Peter, this is one of my favorite conversations. Okay, Simon, his name's Simon to start out with, meets Jesus. Jesus says, hey, I know your name's Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. Like, I'm going to go up to somebody someday and say, hey, I know your name's Billy, but I'm going to call you Bob. All right? Like, <laughs> that's the equivalent of what it was, except for Jesus was referring to Simon as how he saw them. He referred to him as a rock because he was, go he was supposed to be the foundation. Does that make sense? Yeah. David. Anointed as king as a man after God's own heart. Uh -huh. A man after God. Why? Because that's how God sees him. My question is, what does God say about you? Yeah. How many of us are taking the time to listen to what God says about us? Because ultimately, what God says about you is attached to your destiny. Yes. I, heard the, I heard somebody say that the enemy fears you in the place of destiny. The enemy fears you in the place of destiny, but you'll never understand destiny if you don't understand identity. Because right. the two are linked to each other. The two run hand in hand. So what I want to do is, I'm not very good at English, but I'm going to give you a grammar lesson. You guys ready for this? I didn't bring out my chalkboard, but it's all right. Um, the word I am comes from the verb to be. The word I am comes from the verb to be, meaning it's who I am. It's the essence that flows. It's what makes me. It's, it's, it's who I am, really. So the first person version of, I, of to be is I am. The second person version is you are. And the third person is he, she, it is. So do you ever wonder why God tells us who we are? Like he looks at us and he says, and do you ever wonder why he tells you? He looks at you and he says, do you know who you are? You are this. You are this. I love, uh, I think it's First Peter. He says, you are God's special possession, meaning your mom ain't the only one that tells you you're special. God says it too. Okay. He says, you're his special possession. Why does God tell you who you are? This, is, this, this blew my mind. Because when you repeat it, you have to use his name. Does that make sense? If God says that you are my righteousness, in order for you to declare it, you have to say, I am his righteousness. Yeah. Meaning your identity ultimately gives glory to God. Who you are is a glorification of who God is. So if God looks at you and he says that you are my mighty warrior, you, you say, I am your mighty warrior. You're giving glory to God. That's why the enemy can fall down when you declare who you are. Because it gives glory to God. It's stronger than he is. This is what I believe. I believe that once you realize who you are in Jesus, you're stronger than the enemy. Yes. Because when he comes to attack you, then you have the authority to say, nope, that's not from God. Nope, that's not what, that's not what he says about me. But here's the other side, because there's a flip side to this. Anytime you say, I'm not good enough. Anytime you say, I'm too fat, I'm too broke, I'm too this, I'm too that, you're, you're using the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because yeah. this is what that ultimately declares. is if you, if you attach a negative word to that, what you're saying is, God, your creation isn't good enough. God has never spoke that over his creation. He's never spoke that over his creation. So I want to give you an I am statement. I want to give you something that you can speak over you. You guys ready for this? On the count, not on the count of three. I just want you to repeat after me. I want you to say this. I am a victor. I am a victor. 
okay, that was really good, but I'm not really convinced that you really believe it, okay? <laughs> like, come on, let's get, let's get enthusiastic a little bit. If we got to jump, we got to jump. All right, on the count of three, I am a victor. Ready? One, two, three. I am a victor. You are a victor. I want to show you a verse that has radically changed my life. It's Colossians verse thir- or one, chapter 1, verse 13. It says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now, this is one of my favorite verses because it, this is what it looks like. It says, first of all, that your salvation, your transferring did not come on your own doing. It came on God's. Okay, so it says that God has picked us up from this kingdom of darkness, this kingdom of death, this kingdom of chaos, this kingdom of disorder, and placed us in the kingdom of his son, which is a kingdom of righteousness, a kingdom of freedom, and, a, and, and ultimately a kingdom of victory. And this is what I've learned about this. Um, what, actually, yeah, this is what I've learned. And this, this is what changed my life. Is, it's, is We have to understand that this verse basically says that you don't fight for victory, you fight from it. Huh. You're no longer fighting for victory. You're fighting from it. Because ultimately what we're declaring is that our victory came in Jesus at the cross 2,000 years ago. That's our standing place. But there was a quote that that hit me hard. I saw it on Snapchat. That's like the last place to find quotes. But um, I saw it on Snapchat and it said this. It says, you cannot wear the banner of victor and victim at the same time. So what I've learned is that a lot of people believe in the freedom of victory, but they still live in the, in the, in the place of victim. They, so let me rephrase that. I said that wrong. A lot of people believe in the freedom that comes after the cross, but still live as victims before the cross. Man, listen, what happened before the cross, everything that Jesus came, lived, and died for is buried. Don't resurrect it. Leave it down in the ground. You're no longer a victim. You're no longer a beggar. What bothers me in... in it, it stirs my heart is that oftentimes we pray to God as beggars. We're not beggars. We're not victims. We're children of God. The scripture says that we're his righteousness, that we're chosen, that we're a royal priesthood, that we're his special possession. God is speaking things over us and we should pray from the position of those places instead of praying from the position of what was already defeated. Don't resurrect, don't resurrect your previous enemy. He's dead. He's gone. His head has been chopped off. Keep your, keep your foot on the enemy. He has no power over you once you embrace who you are. Because what I've learned is that victory is more about position than it is about outcome. Victory is more about position as, than it is about outcome. And this is, this is why I say that is, is you can lose but still have victory. Amen. I've seen people that maybe their team lost but they had the greatest game of their life. I want to, you know, if you, don't, if you didn't know, I played college baseball. I played at LCU and... This is something that I used to do, and it might be borderline conceited, so judge me later. Um, but in baseball, they do this thing pregame, and it's called in and out, and it's basically a warm up. Well, they'll hit fly balls and grounders to work on hitting your cutoff, making your throws, and all that other stuff, and then the, you get to watch the pitcher warm up before the game started. So, what I would do is I would scoot as close as I could without getting in trouble, and, um, and I would watch them, and I would tell myself that I'm better than they were. I would tell myself that they can't beat me. And my favorite pitchers to face were not the ones that threw like 85. They were the ones that threw 95. Because I told myself that they, they couldn't get me out. They couldn't beat me. See, that's the mentality we got to have when we face the enemy. Is he can't beat you. When you operate out of the place of identity, the enemy can't beat you. And it doesn't matter what he throws at you. He can't beat you. Think about the promise that, that Jesus told uh, Peter. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail, meaning that you are operating from a place of victory. There's a story, I didn't say this in the first service, but it just came up to me. When you, when you talk about the walls of Jericho, uh, Joshua has this conversation with God, and the walls, like the, the, the people in Jericho are terrified. They've locked the gates, everybody knows that the Israelites are there, and God says, see now, don't you see, I've given you the city? And Jer- <laughs> Joshua's like, no, it's locked, like the city's not ours. And what happens is, is what God has showed me is that he can talk in past tense about the, big, the battles you haven't even fought yet. God is speaking in past tense about the, victory, the battles that you haven't fought yet because he's already given you the victory. He's giving you the victory. So how do I prove this? How do I prove that victory is more about position than it is outcome? David and Goliath. I love David and Goliath. When I was younger, I used to have this picture Bible that my mom would read to me because I couldn't read. And she would always read to me David and Goliath. And I don't know if it's because she knew I was going to be short. (laughs) I meant tall because y'all know how I feel about the short word. Uh, 
But my mom would read David and Goliath. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot to learn from David before Goliath. There's a lot to learn before, about David before Goliath. So the way that this starts is Saul is the king at the time. He gets the kingdom ripped away from him, right? Gets the kingdom ripped away. So uh, God tells Samuel to go anoint the next king. He's at the house of Jesse. Samuel goes to Jesse's house. Jesse invites all of his sons except for one. He, Samuel looks at him. He's like, these aren't the guys. Do you have another one? He's like, yeah, but he's just a shepherd. So David was rejected by his dad, right? This is interesting because what you can learn from that is you don't have to be accepted to live in victory. You don't have to be accepted by people to live in victory. So David gets anointed king. And then later on down the road, there's the Israelites have this standstill with the Philistine army. And there's this big giant Goliath uh, that comes out. He's like 10 foot tall, 9 foot something, whatever. He's a huge dude, okay? He comes out and he's defying the armies. And he's, he's mocking God. And he basically makes this, he says, listen, you send out a champion. I'll fight him. If I beat him, y'all are our slaves. If he beats me, we'll be your slaves. That's the agreement. So one day Jesse says, hey, David, I want you to go and deliver bread and cheese to your brothers. He had three brothers in the army. Now, this is what's funny to me because it's hot in the Middle East, right? So cheese is going to melt. So I think David was the first pizza delivery boy. That's just me, okay? I really do. So that's how Pizza Hut got started. <laughs> Now I'm hungry. No, I'm just joking. Uh, so David shows up and he delivers this to his brothers. And he hears the, this, this Israelite guy talking. He was like, have you heard about this giant? And he hears about how he's been defying God and mocking God. And then he gets down to this place. This is so funny. He gets down to this place and he says, yeah, man, whoever, whoever goes and kills this giant, they get their families exempt from taxes for the rest of their life. And he gets to marry the king's daughter, which, you know, if the king's trying to lay up his daughter as a, as a, rent, as a prize for fate, facing this giant, dude, this girl is hot. Like, let's just be real, right? So David, this is what's so funny though. Have you ever had somebody tell you something that was like too good to be true and you were like, hey, tell me again? Like that was David. Like this guy tells him, he's like, yeah, man, if you, if you win, you know, you get this and this. David's like, say what? <laughs> <laughs> and this is basically how it sums up. He says, I get to save money and I get the honey. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> He's like, I'm in. I'm going to go do it. So he goes and he goes, he comes up to Saul. And man, this, this conversation is powerful. 1 Samuel 17, verse 32, it says, Don't worry about this Philistine, David tells Saul. He says, I'll go fight him. Look at how Saul replies. He says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he has been a man of war since his youth. Now, there's two things that really strike me about this. Okay, the first one, if, if I'm David, I'm tired of being rejected. He got rejected by his father and he got rejected by his king. But the second thing is he says, you're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. Meaning that age does not define victory. It does not matter how old you are to live from the position of victory. It matters where you stand, who you stand in. So David says, um, he says this, he says, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goat, which is great uh, repertoire for going to fight a giant, if you think about it. Um, <laughs> He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I will do this to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me. Listen, here's his position. The Lord who rescued me. From the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. So David has this conversation. He comes up to Saul and he says, listen, you can look at my youth and, and, and disqualify. I can, you can try to describe me, but I know what God has defined me as. He says, you can say what you want to say over me, but this is what I've seen. I've seen lions and I've defeated them. I've seen bears and I've defeated them. And because God was with me in both of those, I know he's faithful enough to be with me as I face the giant. See, there's a secret that David has understood that we have forgotten as as believers, you want to know what it takes to live a lifestyle of victory? You ready for this? This is the secret. Come on. The secret to living a lifestyle of victory is remembering. Glory yes. to Jesus. Is remembering. We get in different battles and we're like, God, where are you? God, why, why is something else coming at me? Why is it so hard? And it's because we forgot how he's delivered us in the past. See, the truth is we're all here because we've been delivered, meaning that we've had a victory in our life. God has been faithful for us at least one time. I know he's been there more than once because he's that good, but, but we forget that. We lose it. See, and this is the truth is today's victories are faith for tomorrow's battles. All right. 
Today's victories are faith for tomorrow's battles. I love Joe. (laughs) See, there's an Old Testament thing that we've just kind of forgot. We've left out. In the Old Testament, they used to make altars. Altars were used for two things. They were used for sacrifice and they were used as signs of remembrance. Meaning, if God had did something that would make an altar so that when people would pass by, that they would remember, this is what God did here. But here's the crazy thing, is the altars weren't just for the here and now, they were for generations later. That's right. That's right. The altars that you make to celebrate the victories now might be faith for somebody down the road. Somebody you may never see, somebody you may never come across, but your victory might be the, the, the platform for which stands and gives them the faith for the battle that they're about to face. Mm. Good. See, there's something, if you, if you know my vehicle, I drive this little white Dodge Durant, Dakota, something. It's, <laughs> it's a truck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you don't know where I came from, I came from this, this church called the River in Panhandle. And at the river, we had this, our logo was this leaf with this white R in it, uh, talking about Ezekiel 47. And if you look at my truck, you'll see I have the loft sticker on the right side, or the left side, and, and my river sticker on the right side. And the reason that I haven't taken my river sticker off is not because I have a lack of allegiance, but it's an altar to me to remind me what God's done the, pre, the, the last four years of my ministry. What are altars that you've built up to remind yourself how good and uh, faithful God is? To remind yourself that God has delivered you from this so he can get you to that. See, this is what I love about David. Look at the order that he says it. He says, God has delivered me from the lion. He's delivered me from the bear. And he's going to deliver me from the giant. Bears are bigger than lions and a giant's bigger than the bear. See, there's a progression of your victory. Yeah. There's a progression of your victory. Because the, the last thing the enemy wants to do is he wants to get you to downsize yourself. Right? This is what I believe. So I believe nobody else stood up from the Israelite army because they didn't think that they were big enough. They didn't think that they were strong enough. But David didn't lean on strength. He didn't lean on his own capabilities. What he said is, I, I'm going to defeat him because the Lord is with me. That's right. Does that make sense? As long as God is with you, it doesn't matter how big the enemy is in front of you. He's going to fall. Come on. He's going to fall. So I want to ask our worship team to come up because I love music and we're kind of at the close. But there's something I want to show you is you are a victor. There's a scripture that in this scripture has, has drastically changed my life. Romans 8 verse 37. If you don't have this one marked in your Bible, you should go mark it because I'm telling you it's that good. Romans 8 37 says this. It says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors, more than conquerors. Conquerors go and take territory, right? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So this is what I've learned is everybody knows the scripture that says we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, right? Yes. We will overcome. That's, that's how we have victory. The blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, which is ultimately victory anyways. But the word for overcome is the same Greek word for the, for the word more than a conqueror. And it's this Greek word hypernikeo. Hypernikeo. Now I'm going to get nerdy with you guys for a little bit. So bear with me. Does anybody in here wear Nikes? Nikes are biblical. Everybody needs to get a pair. <laughs> the company Nike originated from the Greek word Nike. Which is Nikeo, means victory. It means victory. Every time you look at your Nikes, remind yourself that you have victory. So when you look at that word, the way it's broken up, it says hyper victory. Hyper victory. I looked at the prefix, just some definitions for the word hyper. Over victory. Beyond victory. Exceeding victory. Excessively victory. Above normal victory. Ultimately abundance in victory. So because of what Christ has done on the cross and because we are in Jesus, we were experience, created to experience over victory. We were created to experience an abundance of victory. Victory is who we are. So when we say, I am victor, I am a victor, I am victorious, what you're declaring is that victory is who God has created me to be. And that there's nothing that can come and take that away. Scripture declares it. Scripture confirms it. It says that you are victorious. That you are more than a conqueror. That you will. Not that you might. Not that you possibly could. It says you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Victory is who you are. (laughs) 
So I want to close with this last verse. Back to Colossians. Colossians 1, or chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Yes. Where Christ is seated in the place of honor at God's right hand. Where Christ is seated at the place of honor. And the second verse says to think about heavenly things because oftentimes you think about what your eyes are set on. See, the, the Bible tells us in Revelation some realities of heaven. It tells us that there'll be no mourning, no pain, no sickness. That's why he says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. But church, let me give you an even greater reality. The grave is empty. That Jesus is seated at the place of honor. That death couldn't defeat him and the grave couldn't hold him. That's the greatest reality. That's why we're here. Is because Jesus is who he says he is. And because he is who he says he is, we get to live as who he says we are. Don't let the world describe you anymore. Don't let your situations, your circumstances, your finances, the this, that, don't let it describe you anymore. You're defined as children of God. You are victorious. You are righteous. You are his special possession. I love this. You are his masterpiece. Come on, somebody. So this is why I want everybody to stand up. We're going to go into this place of worship. Ask our ministry team to come forward. Man, I just want to tell you, remind you, maybe you're here and you've said yes to Jesus. You're like, man, I don't have a victory to stand on. Yeah, you do. It was the cross. Yep. If you need a starting point, stand on the cross. Jesus is your victory. But maybe you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus. Maybe you're here and and life's chaotic. You're like, man, I just need a breakthrough. Listen, I'm telling you, there's only one that can bring transformation, and his name is Jesus. This This is how much God loves you, church. Is Jesus left the place of honor to come and deliver a message that we might reject. And if there was a 1% chance that one person would have said yes, it was good enough for him. God loves you so much that he was willing to face rejection for one person. And now there's people around the world being radically changed by Jesus. Man, if you're here in this place and you don't know that God loves you, I'm here to tell you, you have a victory. You have a Savior. You have a Lord. His name is Jesus. And I can promise you that you'll spend eternity with Him if you'll declare Jesus as Lord. So that's our prayer. One, our prayer is that we live out victory. I want to encourage you guys. In the morning, when you look in the mirror, start declaring over yourself what God says about you. Because the more you start to speak it and the more you start to hear it and the more you start to see it, the more you'll start to believe it. That's right. You are meant to walk out what God says about you. Not just listen to it, not just say it, but you are supposed to walk it out. So let's pray. So dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. God, we thank you in this place. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son to come and die for us. God, and I declare that there is spiritual victory today. That if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, God, that you would stir something up in their spirit. That they would not remain dormant. That they would not care what other people think. But that they would come forward and they would say, man, I want to live life with Jesus. I want to do life with Jesus. But God, if we've, if we've said yes to Jesus, I pray that we lay down the, the nature of being a victim, the nature of being a beggar aside, and we start living as what you say after the cross, God. That was all defeated. It was all left in the grave, God. And you speak life into us. You speak purpose into us. You speak identity into us. So let us look for the scriptures that tell us who we are. Let us look for the scriptures that tell us that we're your masterpiece, that we're your special possession, that we're your royal priesthood, that we're your chosen people God because that is the truth the ultimate truth is if we don't know where to go we can stand on the fact that you say that we are children of God and that is who we are so God I declare that over everybody I declare that we are your children but we are also your victors God we were created to destroy the gates of hell that try to get in our way so God I pray that here in this place that you bring great revelation of identity to everybody God so that they can learn to see them not just for them but so that they can learn to see others the way that you see them God God let there be an abundance of love flow from this place because we're ready to soak in all of it that you have for us God. God we love you. We we just declare your victory in this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.